Hello, welcome to Law Master's Lair. I am your Law Master. Here today, for another peek into one of the nations of the inner sea region. Today, and actually for the next month, since I have no specific other videos I have a specific de desire to focus on, I'm going to go hard in one single region. Partially because, until recently, these nations were all controlled by one central power. And today, we are looking at that central power. So here is Cheliax, the Infernal Empire itself. History-wise, the Thurns try to rewrite it every chance they can. However, to get a, as close to the truth as possible, the land started out long ago, as most of Alistan did, as home to Kellens, who had their homes taken away as soon as Taldor showed up. It was the third army of expansion which put most of the southern Alvestan under their control. The land was molded and shaped for 1400 years until it was ready to join as a colony of Taldor, along with Isgore, Andran, Galt, and so on. For centuries, Ostenso served as a capital until 3991 AR, when it was moved to Rest Crown. Shortly after this change, the providential governor of Cheliax, a man by the name of Espex, saw an opportunity as war well began between Talgar and Kedar. So, he, de he declared Cheliax independent and made himself the new king. And soon, many of the provinces of Talgar would choose the new empire over the old. Andran by free will, Isgon Galt, by a force. And so the even tongued conquest set the sun on one power and gave rise to another. However, the old Talon spirit was with the new nation, and what was Talon known best for but expansion? And so Cheliax began to grow in two different ways. First, colonies. Chilax began sending groups out to sea to look for lands unclaimed, by either Talons or Chilaxians at least, to create new cities. This included Salgava, on the edge of the Bay of Desperation in the Morgne. Other colonies established include Corvosa in Varician, Anchor's End and Canaras on the coast of Arcadia, and a Sun Temple colony on Aslantes ruins though this last one is now part of Andram. And for already civilized places, the Everwar was called to conquer. This first began as a failed attempt to conquer Absalom, but eventually brought about actual successes, first by conquering Kari in Rahadon and gaining complete control over the waterways known as the Arch of Aerodin. And then, this led to control over not just the three original vassal nations, but Morthun, Nidal, and parts of the whole of Berkson, and Drama. They also considered last war, but decided they wanted nothing to do with going to Whispering Tyrant, and so left at the only former Talder colony still standing. Eventually, when the war chest ran dry, Aneta focused on the minds of Chelish. The Starfall Doctrine, a prophecy that Aradin would return to the world and take the crown of Chiliax, making a nation center to his everlasting empire. For 200 years, preparations were made, including the abduction the day before the actual date it was supposed to happen, of King Gaspardar I in preparation to welcome Aradin back into the world. 4,605 AR, all of Cheliax was ready for their god king. Then Aerodin died, and the preparations turned over the government to him, left the country with no government. And so the chaos known as the Chelish Civil War began. Again, eventually, Gaspardar was assassinated, which brought two forces to the forefront. 
House Therion and their naval power, and the thrice damned House Thurn. The Thurns, though they through the deals with both devils and hell knights, eventually returned order, but not without great cost to the nation. Salgava was the first colony to break away, followed by Mathurn, Dahl, and Kavosa walking away all during the war. And afterwards, Galt and finally Andran left through ide ideological differences. Chiliax had lost its full might. However, the Therns did fill their one promise to nation. They brought order. Of course, today we are starting with a big topic, looking at the faith of Chiliax. Most people think it is just praise Asmodeus, and that is everything. Well, no. That's next week. When it comes to faith, Chiliax is actually slightly more varied. You see, Asmodean does not actually care if you worship other gods, as long as you acknowledge his own strength and don't go against him. If you want to fake your devotion to Asmodeus, the condemning motions are good enough for him. That said, there are organizations like the Inquisition, who work to ensure that the aristocracy are doing what they can to set an example. Which, most cases I find praiseworthy of any organization which comes down harder on those in power than those disadvantaged, but it's the Church of Asmodeus. So, aristocracy makes it a spectator spot to try to show devotion with losers having everything precious taken from them, while commoners are allowed to keep their private shrines as long as they celebrate every bloody holiday. And, of course, that the deity is not one of chaos, whose goal is to ruin Asmodeus' perfect order, of course. Other deities which are found in Chiliax are Avadar, Aristotle, Iomide, and Sanre. And, of course, various lesser devil demigods. Now, the question of faith out of the way, let's take a closer look at what Chiliaxons are. That's right. This was just a ploy to get another main ethnicity off my checklist. Chiliaxians are an ethnicity that was born from the union of the already mixed Talons, with the addition of orphans who traveled down the west coast. Though they would rather that read Aslantians than Talons, Talons are kind of rivals. And the Aslanti, well, you know how they are, and how everyone is about them. The Chilish tend to have the hair and eye colors common with the Talons, while also having the pale skin from the orphan side of the family. They also tend to have sharper facial features. Chelish do tend to also possess rare traits like red hair or eyes, which some whisper might be diabol diabolic influences on their blood. But this is usually just genetics. Usually. Like the Talons, they prefer to dress rich, but consider themselves more modest and therefore avoid being gaudy. Diabol diabolism or not, aside, Chilaxians have always been good when it comes to matters of law. They learn from an early age to read an entire contract, and find ways to getting up an upper hand is in such matters are a sign of strength among them. And as for hobbies, well, specifically in Chiliax, everything which is not forbidden is permitted. So homebound Chilaxians tend to have their pick of drug dens, brothels, and gambling houses. And for those with less cash, blood spots. At home or not, the Chilish like their art. Paintings, sculptures, music, and buildings, of course. But for the Chilish, theater and opera stand out among them. Various 
famous players came from childish hands over the centuries, which includes the newer theater of the real, a new style of performance in which the story is made more realistic by having actual actors get hurt or killed on stage. Because Chelly acts. Which brings us to our first side tangent of the day. The part of the show where we take a nice, quiet stop to the reading section. Today we have two books from the Wall of the Lion, both connected to the Chilaxian stage. The first is from Arcane Anthology, which is a book we have met a few times before. The second is the first out of my favorite of the anthology books, Psychic Anthology which I fi finally get to talk about. So, starting out, we have the workbook of Lacoris Serini. Lacoris is a fame, is a man famed throughout Cheliax as a master of the arcane, of the martial, and of the arts. He is most known for writing several famous plays about Asbodius and developing various spells to make the illusions of the stage that much more real. His workbook, starting originally as his own personal journal, contains various stage-themed spells like Heckle and Stage Fright, but also can teach a Mangus how to control if their opponents like a puppet. Psychic-wise, we have a book devoted to one of my favorite 1A classes, the Olivario Episcals. The book was penned by opera singer Octa... Octavaca Olivario, a prima donna who became the talk of town in high society, despite not being the best singer. How did she make her way? Well, she had special hypnotic eyes, which she leveraged to get the crowd to adore her. The Episcals appear at first to just be a strange arrangement of songs and lyrics crossing the page in unusual patterns. Those with the mesmerist traditional stair habit can see their hidden collection of knowledge on hypnotic powers. These include various ways to use the mesmeric tricks and stairs in ways that break the class already amazing powers to break. Moving on to the local government, state is a feudal one, which means at the very top is the queen, Abigail Thurn II. Right below her is the Church of Esmodius itself. Both these need no introductions. Under them are the nobles, with a distinction between the old and new nobles. Old nobles are those who blo whose bloodlines go back centuries and who would in any other circumstance, be the ones calling the shots. But the old are marked as not having shown enough devotion to the new Chiliacs yet, and therefore fall under the new aristocracy, those who have shown loyalty to the Thun, and whose family's estates are said to be in hell itself. Then we have the wealthy who don't have noble titles, Below them are merchants and guildsmen, below them are craftsmen, below those are laborers, next down on the ladder are serfs, and at the bottom are slaves. Outside of the normal hierarchy are three groups who are still devoting themselves to a nation of Chiliacs. Hellites, Inquisitors, and monks from different infernal churches. Which, speaking of monks, I believe that brings us to our second side tangent. First, we had non-god related books. Now we have a non-god fighting style. Do you know, no, I do not know why I'm chomping at a bit at this moment for another god video. It's not like I not, don't do it one every month. <laughs> Either way, today we talk of Hamatsu Latsu. This fighting style has been mentioned in some of the earliest Pathfinder materials, dating back to 2008. 
This fighting style is one of many within Sheliak's devised to mimicking the attacks of a devil. This one specifically focusing on the Hamatula, or barbed devils, Hell's own jailers and guardians. This fighting style was first developed in Rest Crown by an organization known as the Sisterhood of Eseth and has spread through their traveling offshoot, the Sisters of the Golden Aliens. I can never pronounce that word, I'm not going to try it. <laughs> Next, as per tradition, let's take a look at the regions of Chiliax, the f five of the six archduchies. We'll, of course, get to the six eventually, but not today. First is the Heartlands the central portion of Chiliax. Home of the capital city of Chiliax, Egoian. What started as a small fishing village on the Lake of Sorrow, grew into one of the greatest trading hubs in the region, eventually becoming the capital when the Thurans took the staffs away from West Crown. They also gave the city a little facelift, changing the town from organically flowing through the, with the natural curves of the ground to everything orderly and pristine. The rest of the Heartlands itself is the breadbasket of the region. It has cities like Longacre, home to soldiers who no longer can or no longer have the will to fight. Zanala, a city where tiefling are actually treated well, and Dakarium, home to Jovel, Faborn, sorcerers who pay lip service to their neighbors. For natural landmarks, we have the Lake of Sorrow, the only freshwater lake in Chiliax, Igobarius, plains, large fields perfect for farming and centaurs, the Bar Woods, where fey feel at home, and the Whisper Woods, where our natural creatures and bandits feel at home. Because say what you want about the law, you're not going to get every criminal. Next at hand we have Sirmian, the southeastern region named after the Sirmian Plains. Here is a region known for its farming and ranching, and also as a place with large presence of the Chelish army, continually, continually monitoring the eastern border. Its regional capital, Ostenso, is also home to the Chelish navy, and is home to one of the largest shipping empires in the inner sea region, as well as being a center of slave trade. And let's not forget, it is also home to the Apsis Consortium. Another coastal city is a castral, a hilly town which is mostly built on plateaus and uplands, whose made commerce deals not with trade, but with industry. Maserius is a town on the bowl of Iskar, with an army at the ready should Iskar be the next region to betray Chiliax. It is known for being a large merchant hub for international trade, but also a place with a noticeable black market of foreign goods. Finally, Braskawak is home to the largest gnome only towns in the inner sea region. The place is famous for architects and engineers. They have made a deal with where they trade alchemetic and arcane goods to, to the throne, to largely be ignored by the throne. Which, taking a step back up the list, brings us to our third side tangent, the Aspis Consortium. The consortium started as a legendary shipment of worthless trinkets that magically turned into an entire hall full of relics during transport. As if by magic. The consortium has continued to profit, profit off of good luck and favorable deals since then, becoming enemy to other relic hunters like the Pathfinders. The consortium structure is to ensure that no agent can be traced back to the hole, allowing those who get caught doing something illegal to be disposed of for the greater good. Emphasis on caught. 
Examples of members of the Aspis Consortium include curators, those who borrow helpful artifacts, which allow them to continue to get more wealthy for the more wealth in for the whole, while still keeping some of the shinies to the on hand. Or a dozen shinies. Well, at least it keeps them being fully affected from harmful items. Ring leaders are those who lead lesser agents in the field. They lay out plans, and having bonuses almost like a bardic performance. They are also skilled at outdoing their underlings and whipping them into shape when needed. Finally, Aspis agents are the various unscrupulous people who work for the consortium. They are skilled at finding traps and secret doors in order to find treasures and come back alive, and set traps for others. They also learn many of the tricks of the trade that come with their occupation, mostly when it comes to stealing and hoarding. Traveling along the southern coast, we have the La Archduchy Long March. This includes the Arc of a Arch of Aridin, not Arc, Arch, the strait which connects the inner sea to the Arcadian Ocean, control of which allows Sheliac's control of sea trade. This trade centers on Corinthian, the Archduchy's capital. This region is also known for halfling domination of the Thieves Guild and dark working, giving them more respect here than in other places in Chiliax, though it's still a hub of international slave trade. It's Chiliax, what do you expect? This is also the location of West Crayon, the former capital of Chiliax. This is the location where much of the older nobles held dominion, and where they mostly con congregated when the Thurns took control. It still stands to, as a monument to the glorious past when Aradin was still alive, and many of the saints came from the city. Messini is a narrow small port town. It used to be a holy town to Abadar, and most of the citizens are still his followers. The city is full of followers of absolute law, which has allowed him to get along decently with Asmodians, as well as be controlled by forces like Baal Masters. One more place of note in the ruins of include the ruins of Dang, a city which was destroyed during the storms accompanying the death of Aradin. Which, backing back to West Crown, we have one of their premier organizations, the Council of Thieves. They are the rulers of the underground risen from their devil-worshipping form or organization to one who continues to continue on the traditions of West Crown, even though they are the egalitarian ones as opposed to the nobles who ran the first council. The council is currently one run by three peop who, people who are in a polyamorous relationship. We have the changeling, a pest Apexia Wintrish, who has a deep interest in West Crown's history. We have Marcelano Haltero, a gentleman thief who is against harming regular citizens. And finally, we have Sibrion Mistroia, a drow who brought some of the drow's secrets to the council and who is interested in using the funds of the organization for artistic pursuits. For examples of the kind of members you can expect, we have those brazen deceivers, those who lie and use a bit of shadow magic from a shadow demonic artifact to stay ahead. We have the dashing thieves, who are strushbucklers first, thieves second, and charmers whenever you want them to be. And then we have the rest crown devils, those who stand by everything the city used to be, using techniques based off of Aradin and the founders of the city uh, to slowly become kings of the street. All in all, 
they are interesting relics from 1E that I would like to see in 2E. Especially since they just scream the kinds of people who would get along well as firebrands. But more on that next month. Now we finally reach the West Coast, the Archduchy of Hell Coast. This coast is traced along by half of the Mendo Mountains. It is well known for its formal, former capital, the city of Pezak, which was once burned down for anti thune sentiment, but was rebuilt by those who refused to stay down. Eventually, anti thune plays and poetry led to a second skirmish, which led to the current blockade. Yet still the town stands, its arts popular in various anti thune nations. For less successful rebellions, I direct you to the ruins of Norona. So yes, this re region is the one most marked by standing against the Thuns. With the town in open rebellion, the regional capital is now instead in Belde, home of its administrator. I will also go more into the administrators of these archduchies, but they are mostly just Thun puppets, they don't matter. Anyway, the mountains in this region are also home to Devil's Perch, one of the largest cities of Strix. Outside, we have a couple of islands which belong to this archduchy. First is Chunian, traditional home of giants until the Chelish ran them out. However, a secret cell believes it's almost time to take the home back. Shardstone, on the other hand, seems uninhabited, but is actually home to a secret fern lab where inhuman experiments are conducted. Funny enough, we have the Mendo Mountains making up the border with Nadal, as well as serving as its own archduchy. I, I know some of you are expecting a sixth archduchy, but that will be its own video someday for you know why. <laughs> anyway, between the mountains and the barrel woods stands Cantaria the capital of this region. It is a city which is a trade post with neighboring Nadal, as well as famed for being the location where Iomide performed her famed 10th act, ruling the town for a year and a day. More on that whenever we get to her. The other big town of the region is Taganhold, a town established by a drove and trappers. They are known for having produced the roads that go through the famed Mendo Gap, which connects the, the country to its northern neighbor, as well as the Mendo Keep, to keep the two nations separate. Tungenhold is also not that far from St. Ilya's Fountain, a healing spring on the site of the death of Iomide's first saint. Outside of that, it is all mountain ranges, the region living off the mining industry. And slaves. Because Chiliacs, what more do you expect? Which brings us to the end of today's video. Which sets up pretty nicely talking about us talking and taking care of the self question of Avastan. Not counting this one as a themed month like I did Orc Month, but you're going to get some of the same notes hitting in the near future. Speaking of which, come back next week for more Diabolism in the form of a God video. I look forward to seeing you all next time.